new digital strategy. And the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development helped develop the content of this strategy. Martin, I think we lost you. Can you still hear us? No. Recording in progress. Kibuki, Kenya, and Somalia. The topic of this year's internet governance forum is resilience, sustainability, and the shared future of the world, as you know. And this perfectly fits to this open forum's focus digital public infrastructure. Let me give you two examples why I feel that resilience and digital public infrastructure are two sides of the same coin. Let's first look at an example from India, a country with 1.4 billion inhabitants. In 2009, India started Abhar, a public initiative which gave its residents a unique identity. With the COVID-19 pandemic strike in 2020, a similar infrastructure could be used to deliver financial aid directly and rapidly to residents. Digital ID and e payment have an enormous potential as it allows all people, especially women and other vulnerable groups, to profit from public services. We can suddenly reach billions on their smartphones without intermediaries. The user is at the heart of good digital public infrastructure, UPI. Putting the human in the center requires standards for safe and secure UPI. A great policy example of data protection policy framework is, of course, the GDPR in Germany. Let us have a look at the second example. A similar pattern as in India could be observed in Nigeria. During the Ebola pandemic in 2004, the innovative idea of digitally tracing contact via smartphones in an app was implemented. This tool, known today as Thomas, was used during the COVID-19 pandemic everywhere around the world, and rolled out even all over Germany. Is that a great example of reverse innovation? These two examples illustrate how digital public infrastructure that has been designed in an open and inclusive way is versatile and increases society's resilience. There are risks too. Do we want to leave topics like data privacy to the markets, to those big tech companies that only care about profit? Do we want autocracies, autocracies to globally spread their model of digital transformation, often a model of digital disinformation, a model where the sole purpose is to sustain control over the citizen? Or do we want a digital transformation which puts the needs and rights of the individual first? At the end, this is what social inclusion means. For the poor, in rural areas, women, elderly, not only for male hipsters and capitals. It is a social, ecological, and feminist digital transformation that the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development in Germany promotes globally. Promote it to provide a genuine alternative to autocratic and hyper-capitalistic modes of digitalization. When listening to the global digitalization community, but, uh, Axel already mentioned that I am around in, in this uh, area for a while now, I noticed that open, reusable, interoperable, sustainable digital building blocks are the key to success. The challenge contribution in this domain is the before mentioned GASTEC initiative. What GASTEC offers does not lead to new dependencies. On the contrary, it will strengthen digital sovereignty of partner governments, their ability to adopt already existing solutions, and make their own choices to build the future digital government step. GASTEC is the first global initiative of its kind that develops a global toolbox of building blocks for e-government services. So that's what we're talking about here, mainly it's e-government and government. According to the GASTEC 
philosophy. These solutions should be built only once and reused by everyone for free. That's also so true. In a nutshell, investing bricks rather than in houses. That allows you to build whatever your people and art to buy and matches your needs. We truly believe that the knowledge that is needed for these kind of building blocks, like digital ID, payments, data exchange, is spread all over the world. It is our objective and community effort to collect these expertise, learn from each other, and make it available for all. We want to build this global community with as many far thinking digital leaders as possible who are aligned in digital solidarity. Hello, it has been a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much for the attention and I wish you, wish us a fruitful discussion. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, I think this was a very um important uh, input and uh, thank you for really opening up the the topic and uh, giving us uh, the different perspective and uh, also the clear perspective of the german government and in particular your ministry um and uh, martin i think we will now pursue here with the discussion and um, uh, maybe uh, at a later uh, time in this uh, session you can also join us here if possible, for another round of questions. So I would want to uh, introduce now the panel individually when I start asking my questions. And I'm very happy to have you here, actually. Uh, and I'm looking forward now uh, to the discussion. So we have listened to Martin. We probably also all know here in the room and maybe also the folks uh, online what the GovStack initiative is a little bit about. Uh, and I think now we want to dig a little bit deeper into the question of the relationship of digital public infrastructure uh, and resilience, the potential, also the issues I've mentioned in my uh, introductory remarks. My remarks. I first warmly welcome Ms. Nele Leosk. She is ambassador at large for digital affairs at the Estonian Ministry for Foreign Affairs. We are very happy to have you here, Nele. Um, as a global leader in digitalization of government services, how do you feel has digital public infrastructure increased the resilience, social inclusion, and good governance in your country? Please. So we start, right? Yes, we start. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much, and uh, and I am also. I hope everybody has no better. I'm also very glad uh, to be here together with our our partners or uh, in in GovStack, uh, the government of Germany, ITU, and uh, and Dial. Uh, which I believe is not represented here today, but but definitely here at the event, um, uh, very much so. Uh, but uh, to answer your question and perhaps actually uh, to introduce the topic of digital public infrastructure, I do not know how many of uh, us are aware of the concept because it is a rather new term, actually. It's not that we have been uh, developing digital public infrastructure for the past 30 years um, in, uh, uh, in Estonia. But, so I would perhaps um, give um, a context that would uh, understand why Estonia uh, has been for the past years being the leader in, in digitalization and, uh, and how it has also now started to be referred to as one of the countries that um, has built the digital public infrastructure and and is also the promoter of digital public um, uh, goods so we have to go back in time actually uh, and uh, and uh, 30 years and i'm not going to give the 30 year story of estonian digital development there is a i am here for these uh, three days at least and, and and there is a google and and, and many other things that can help um, but uh, uh, estonia started to reform its government, uh, um, more or less the same time the browser was invented in 1993, which actually allowed uh, to do things differently. And, and I think this is also what this the public infrastructure is about. It's about how we see our society, how we see the democratic uh, society and, and what we see the role of government is. Because it all started with an understanding that the, the government is there to give and also to share whatever the government is doing. And, um, and of course, there is a technological side, but more than more to technology, there is actually how you build um, 
your government and uh, and also the entire ecosystem together with your partners from private sector but also the um, uh, the, the public and um, and i would say that actually the very first steps uh, were taken in the 90s already uh, when Estonian government really put a lot of emphasis on uh, public information, on data, access to data, and also the reuse of data. And, uh, and of course, there is an aspect of e efficiency because we have followed the once-only principle, which in a way allows uh, to be more efficient so the government doesn't um, uh, collect one, date, uh, one data many times, but it allows also to provide what you were referring to, these efficient and easy to use services, because you need data uh, from different organizations, both from private sector and uh, public sector. And in a way to support these core principles, I guess what Estonia's most famous digital public good is uh, currently, and maybe some of you have already heard uh, of X-Road, which is basically uh, a layer that allows to exchange data between government, but also um, uh, public uh, uh, sector. So I would say that the role of data public infrastructure and data public goods is actually to support the democratization uh, and, and I would say the good governance. It's not really means in itself to, to reach um, good governance. And, uh, and from that perspective, what also GovStack does, what was also referred to, yes, it looks at these 20, 30 years of experience in terms of technology, and as was also pointed out by Martin Wimmer, um, GovStack does um, provide uh, a, a toolbox, uh, 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 you know, consisting of different uh, digital public goods that the governments may need. Uh, is it a public registry, a digital authentication, uh, digital signature? Uh, data sharing platform or many other solutions that actually could be quite similar across governments around the world because government functions do not differ that much. We all need to provide our citizens driving license or, uh, or give them permits to build houses and, and, and so, uh, so forth. But what it also does is that it collects this expertise and the practice of 20, 30 years and really takes a, a wider approach and the framework and to see what it needs to be done to actually make digitalization work because we all know that it's not about technology i believe almost every country by now has tried to introduce digital identity or at at the city level maybe at the central government level maybe some organization level but we actually do not see so many countries succeeding in putting it into practice. Um, so we can buy technology, some that have more money buy fancier technology, some have less money buy not that fancy technology, some may get it for free, as uh, perhaps through uh, GovStack, uh, using one of our open source and reusable components, but it is ultimately about how you put it to work and for which uh, purposes. So with this perhaps wider uh, context. Uh, I'm uh, closing from my end for now, and and we can see how this discussion goes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We will get back to you, Nele. And I think this was a very, very important uh, contribution. Uh, actually, this broader scope of issues uh, to be considered here was, I think, uh, really uh, very, very rich. I think. Thank you so much. Uh, now I would like to introduce our first online uh, panelist here, Mr. Gautam. Rafi Chander, uh, happy to have you here. Uh, you are the head of strategy at the e-government foundation. Uh, Gautam, can you hear us? E-Gov Foundation, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. The sound quality is not perfect, perfect, but uh, I think we will make an effort. Fantastic, and, uh, fantastic. To understand. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, everyone. Yeah, um, Gautam, let me just ask my question and then I think you can uh, start. Yeah. I think we would be curious to learn from you about the role uh, organizations like your e-government foundation play in developing digital public uh, infrastructure. Can you give us some examples, tell us a little bit about the projects and how they would actually foster social inclusion, please? 
Sure. So, Eka Foundation was set up about 19 years ago, and there are now a variety of organizations coming up like us, but we are one of the oldest in India in this space. And uh, basically, our mandate was to really undertake a similar journey to what GovSAC has uh, been created to undertake, but to help governments in adopting this digital transformation and adopt technologies over a period of uh, and improve their functioning. So, we function as a non profit organization, and we've been set up as a non profit organization for a very specific purpose. Back then, it was felt that uh, where India was, the access to digital public goods, or back then, as we call it, open source software for development, was very limited, and a lot of it was really not built for governance. So, we were created to create uh, those kinds of uh, softwares. Today, we collect all of this together under the banner of Digit, which is a digital public good for governance. Uh, why we exist is because by creating this uh, open source public uh, digital good, people are able to work with us to undertake their transformation journeys in a much more effective manner and not really get worried about vendor lock-ins and are able to pro uh, preserve what is really their digital sovereignty. So they want systems that they know work well for them they know that are under their entire control and so they also know will work at scale so we exist to build those systems and then to work with governments through advisory through capacity building to through helping them set up the right institutional structures internally to uh, take charge of their own digitalization journey the other uh, piece of work that we really do and this goes back to what Neil was talking about is catalyzing ecosystems now typically speaking we don't uh, in the past, we didn't see a lot of ecosystem participation in these complex digital transformation projects. So what would be happening on the ground at a programmatic level was quite disconnected from what was happening in the software. And this led to a lot of people not really trusting software. So organizations like us also work to act as a bridge between market players between government agencies and non-profit actors working on the ground to ensure that all the inputs that need to come in to make programs work on the ground and services get delivered in real world, in the real world to people uh, happen seamlessly because the software works. Over the past uh, five years, what we've also kind of uh, undertaken as a bit of a transition, and it's kind of interesting because GovSAC also reached out to us uh, about a year ago, was to think of from building custom software for governments, how can we create platforms which act as these building blocks that governments can then keep reusing and reusing in different, different domains, and over a period of time have that robust foundation that allows them to uh, keep innovating, but also keep providing good services to people. So we exist for these uh, reasons. Uh, Part of the reason that uh, we are a non-profit is when you're working with governments, it's much easier to actually provide unbiased advice. And sometimes it's also to be able to tell them that if you think of your program in this way, you will achieve your objectives much more effectively, which is a lot harder to do when you're a for-profit uh, vendor kind of organization. So we are non-profit partners and we are unbiased and we help governments make their digital transformation journeys happen through a combination of software and partnerships. Thank you so much, Gautam, for this first remark, and I'm sure we will get back to you. Now I would like to welcome um, my colleague, Miss Andrea Donat. She recently assumed the position of, uh, as a head of program of GIZ's um, GovStack initiative. Uh, Andrea, GovStack is building the first open and interoperable toolbox for e-government services. But uh, besides this, you're already cooperating with partner countries, and I think we are ready to hear from you who is that and what are you actually doing on the ground. Please. Um, thank you. Uh, also from the GovStack team, the entire GovStack team from GIZ, a very warm welcome um, to the session, to all of you. Um, Axel, before I answer this question um, regarding um, and where, what we are actually doing with GovStack and where we are working at, I would like to emphasize a bit on how does actually GovStack work. And GovStack, it is definitely um, a novel approach and so, so is also our service delivery. 
uh, we are very well aware um, of uh, that every country is different. And um, so is also the status of digitalization and um, the digitalization journey in each country. So that means we need like tailor-made um, answers and approaches and all our activities that we're implementing with the countries are very demand-based on the situation in the country. Um, we operate as GAFSTEC, the GAFSTEC initiative as a whole, together with DIAL, ITU and Estonia, um, in a very user-centric manner. And um, in fact, we are co-creating um, our activities very deeply on the partners' needs in any direction. The partner countries for now are um, Egypt, Ukraine and Rwanda, and also the Horn of Africa, which is co-financed by the European Commission. And here we are working together with Djibouti, Somalia and Kenya. So, um, there are actually three ways to work with us as the GovStack initiative. Uh, I would like to start with first, um, you can use as a partner country the GovStack initiative. What do we mean by that? That means as a partner country, you can make use of the building blocks that we're developing uh, to build your national stack and to also or to adjust your existing digital ecosystem. One example for this is um, in Rwanda. As you know, Rwanda is um, doing very well if it comes to uh, digitalization of government. They are running the um, eRambo platform. And they're also in the this year's report um, of the UN, the 2020 uh, eGov report. It's also now stated as one of the high developed uh, digitalized uh, countries. Um, with Rwanda, we were sitting together with working groups and did some workshops and Rwanda um, and Rwanda delegates identified the GovStack initiative and what we have um, specified here as very useful um, also for their stack. And um, they are especially interested in the building block of content management. And uh, last week, it took place a workshop together with ITU and uh, delegates from the Rwandan Ministry of Digitalization in order to look into how they can improve the management of the e-waste management system. So secondly, what you can also, how can you also work with us, the GovStack initiative is you can engage. That means you can engage in one of our, join one of our community structures. Giving an example here is that we are having, we are working together with more than or over 60, uh, 70 experts and more than 15 working groups. And this is technical working groups that are working on specifying um, our building blocks. And um, yeah, this is like one example how you can actively also participate in um, building the stack here. Um, thirdly, you can contribute uh, to the GovStack uh, sandbox or to the sandbox toolbox that we are developing. And that means that countries can provide and should provide their national digital tools to the GovStack initiative. And this is um, what brings the, uh, the initiative further as well and what's definitely needed. One example for this is our cooperation with Ukraine. Ukraine is our latest partner and um, that's joined the GovStack initiative. And we are formally signing um, the um, declaration of intent and cooperation 1st of December by mid of this week um, in Berlin. So we are very happy for this. Uh, Ukraine is um, a very good example for the government of um, President Zelensky. They um, put a lot of effort and a lot of um, budget into digitalizing the state within the last two years. And they put a lot of efforts into digital infrastructure and also to, into DPI. Um, through this, they now have the ability to stay in contact with their population and provide basic services via the DIA app or the e Maliatko, that's a birth registration app, even in times of crisis. And um, yeah, I think in this case, we can definitely see in the case of Ukraine that it perfectly demonstrates and also sadly, but nicely that consequent investments in high quality public infrastructure systems can definitely strengthen the resilience in times of crisis. Thank you, Andrea. I think you have really put a lot of flesh to the bone. I think we understand much better now what the initiative means in, in uh, practice and in practical terms. And thank you also for referring to the case of the Ukraine. Um, next, I would like to introduce Professor Josef Noll. He teaches at the Department of Information Technology at Oslo University and is the Secretary General at the Basic Internet Foundation. Josef, from your experience as a researcher and advocate uh, for global digital equity, how do we ensure that digital public infrastructure as we imagine it 
actually takes hold in emerging economies. So do we actually gain momentum and if so, how? And how do we ensure user centricity and inclusiveness on top? Please. Thanks so much, Axel. I'd, uh, I'd love to bring us a bit back to the internet. Uh, because the internet, when it came to Norway, to our building as the Arpanet in June 1973, it was really driven by academics. And uh, what, what I'm asking myself when we work here with communities in 14 countries in Africa is, can we translate the Western approach which we have for the internet uh, towards emerging economies. I don't. I, I concentrate here on Africa because that is where I put my feet around and where I where I'm known how rural Africa looks like. And there are two points. One point is in our Western tradition, we all pay for the access. We pay for the fixed access for the internet in our homes. We pay for the mobile access. And, and that, those packages together, like in Norway, for me, it's typically around $65 to put a number out. Of course, for Nile in Estonia, it's $20 and, and that covers uh, lifelong free access every month. So the first one is the payment. And this payment has actually resulted in that the model of the cloud, the model of the data centers, of the centralized data centers works. Now, the second point in the emerging economies, it simply means that here in Africa, the distances are so big, the infrastructures are so costly, we can't put a fiber to base stations simply because it's, it's purely from the size of Africa. It's not possible. And second, we don't have the economy to actually pay our 20, 40, 60 dollars for the access. And these both points for me put the big question out saying, no, the model of the internet as we have it in Europe or in the Western economies is not the model which we can translate. And when I come to, uh, back to, to India, I love the discussion with Gio of saying that, well, you know, $2.50 uh, per month for 1.5 gigabyte per day is the cost you pay. $2.50 per month for 1.5 gigabyte. And, and, then, and then when I was in the meeting with the CEO of uh, Gio, I asked him, how do you finance? And he said, look, the money is not in the access. But we built an internet where the money is in the access. And so I'm asking ourselves, can that actually work? Or do we need to revisit? Like when we discuss here in, in Tanzania with um, Rosalind Mvoria, the head of Vodacom Foundation, she says 75 to 80% of the connections to the internet are from 2G, 75 to 80 percent, which means only like 20 to 25 percent are 3G or 4G based, are internet access enabled phones. The rest is just, and that simply means that when we talk about the digital public infrastructures, we don't stand a chance with the current model to bring it across. And if we then say we want the free access, which was uh, which was country uh, recall, one of us said it. Then how can we establish that? Do we have to think differently? Do we have, from the university point of view, do we have to teach the universities to connect schools, and build women empowerment spots in each and every village? This is this just the, the kind of thought which I want to bring into, the, roo into the, the room. We don't have an answer yet, but that is what I'd love to dis uh, discuss here further. Wonderful. I think this was really a very important aspect you have added here to the discussion, the price tag uh, to, to the access to the internet and the role of companies and maybe uh, other business models and the involvement of, of the education sector uh, to um, to enlarge uh, access to um, to internet in particular for uh, certain groups of the population. Thank you so much. I would now invite all of you to ask questions to contribute. I think we are 
for sure also ready to do, to continue our discussion here but uh, I would want to open it up now and to make sure that you can also as we have said it's an open forum and we should use it to uh, raise question and to try to uh, discuss it I don't know whether there is already questions uh, now in the room is there any please go ahead hi um Yes, thank you very much. Um, my name is Florian Marcus. I'm a, a German a digital consultant uh, based in Estonia, so very much inspired by the Estonian way of thinking. Um, I have a question to the two ladies on the panel. Um, so in terms of driving digitalization through GovStack, uh, it seems right now it's primarily uh, nation-based, one country at a time, which is understandable. Um, do you see in the future uh, a sort of cross-border facilitation as well so if we say there are two countries in Africa or elsewhere uh, that say we don't have an electronic ID right now but we both want one and we know that there is a lot of collaboration going on trade and so on between our countries anyway why don't we you know step to the plate at the same time uh, could you see something like this happen as well or how do you how do you see the engagement model develop over the coming years thanks so maybe we add if you allow two more questions we have one question there Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Rapid Sun. I'm from uh, the, uh, Cambodia, the Digital Government uh, Committee uh, of Cambodia. And uh, recently, uh, we just adopted the uh, Digital Government Policy 2022-2035. And uh, I also, uh, in Cambodia, also engaging the uh, local UNDP office. And uh, with the, uh, they also uh, connecting to the ITU about the Gulf State. So uh, my question is, uh, how can uh, we accelerate the adoption of Gulf State in Cambodia? And uh, my uh, second question is about the, uh, is uh, Gulf, Gulf State uh, completely using the X Road technology uh, completely, and uh, is the uh, Gulf State uh, also uh, set the environment uh, development for the uh, uh, digital digital platform or digital services, and uh, also uh, how, if uh, because in in Cambodia we also develop the the uh, data exchange using the X Road technology. So if we uh, already adopt the uh, data exchange using the X Road, how can we migrate? Maybe it uh, a bit technical, but how we can migrate from the uh, the uh, current uh, data exchange to the Gulf state? Thank you. Do you want to, uh, uh, to refer your question to one uh, panelist or to all of them? So then, uh... I, I think maybe my first question about the accelerate the adoption of Gulf state yeah. in Cambodia, maybe. Yeah. To the uh, Andrea, yes, uh, yeah, Andre uh, from GIC. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Good. Uh, then maybe I can invite you to answer those two questions. And I've seen uh, two more hands here in the room. Mm. Okay. Thank you. I start with uh, Florian. <laughs> nice to nice to have uh, you here also. Uh, I think what you're asking is actually already happening uh, uh, in a way. Uh, everybody can contribute to uh, GovStack, but perhaps to to go back why GovStack was born, yeah, GovStack was, was in a way born um, after 20, 30 years into practice of digitalization, realizing that, let's say, some tools that we might need um, and some functionalities that we have across governments around the world are, are similar, despite our, uh, our, our, our differences uh, also. And uh, how it works is that it has sort of identified certain let's say, components we all might need, let's say a registry for businesses, uh, land registry, uh, identity, and it collects the existing practice from both private sector and public se sector across uh, the world, trying at least to, to find this uh, a balance uh, between uh, uh, different um, uh, uh, players that have established uh, themselves in, uh, in this world. But, uh, but very recently, for example, we had a... Uh, a partnership uh, agreement signed with with um, uh, Egypt, and their motivation is not, of course, only to let's say adhere to to some GovStack principles, because GovStack itself does not implement uh, any of these uh, uh, solutions, but also to contribute contribute. So everybody can uh, uh, can contribute. Of course, there is a certain process to to make sure it it all goes how we how how it should go uh, how it should go. Uh, but perhaps uh, to, cop, uh, to just to comment uh, 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 your question about uh, the the X Road, um, X Road is a it is a public good that is currently maintained by Estonian, uh, Finnish, and Icelandic government, which I think is one aspect I didn't mention here but I believe is increasingly more important that we are all 
uh, lacking resources, uh, especially skills. Not It's not that much about money even. Let's say data scientists. We all lack data scientists. And, um, and um, what Estonia has done with XROAD is that it has pooled resources with Finland and also Iceland. So actually we have the community of now three countries uh, maintaining uh, XROAD, which has become, I would say, a, a core component of our critical uh, uh, infrastructure. And I think this is something that at least we would like to see more that we pool resources also across governments. We have been talking about it a lot, but I do not actually see it that much in practice yet, not even within the European Union, uh, where we uh, actually share common aims uh, and, and we all need to reach a certain level of, uh, of, of digitally Station. So perhaps this is something that Govstack might also look into actually to facilitate also this uh, sharing of resources um, across different uh, different partners. We, are, we, are, we haven't done it yet, but it's uh, maybe something we should look into. Thank you, Nele. Andrea? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Nele, and thank you uh, both for your questions. Um, like, First of all, I would like also like to start to say like um, the initiative is still quite young uh, from my perspective, right? So we are um, commissioned by um, from the German side, from GIZ side, uh, like implementing the GovStack initiative also in the countries that I've mentioned um, until the end of uh, uh, 25 right now. So we have some time to go. And the status quo is that we're still in defining the building blocks. And what we're trying to do is we are, or not really trying to do, what we're actually doing is we're building this toolbox and we're building a sandbox. So and what do we mean by that? This is like kind of a test and pilot environment where we can make it much better accessible and much better um, um, possible to test and to demonstrate how the GAF stack um, or the stacks can actually fit and the products can fit into the existing country um, uh, environments and infrastructures. And so also I'm like now um, dropping uh, or taking your question first, like in case of Cambodia. So I, I think um, in general, we can say we are very happy to any conversation um, in this direction with any state. And um, as mentioned, we are not alone as to that we have um, partners Estonia, Dial and also the ITU, which have also their arms in, in many countries. And we are, of course, very happy to get in touch with you in order to have an initial um, uh, conversation about um, what's your interest in and then also to dive deeper into like more technical questions, let's say. And, um, but still at the end of the day, we're then commissioned as uh, GIZ um, from the ministry in order to implement in certain countries. So all the next and further steps then of course are basis for discussion. But as we have also mentioned, we're also looking into uh, the situation that also countries provide their own tools and projects into the toolbox that uh, the GovStack is developing. So um, we are very happy to um, yeah, get in touch and um, yeah, maybe we can um, have a conversation and change cards afterwards. Um, and also like also from your perspective, I would like to make uh, maybe use um, of the situation um, and the lucky situation that we have more people in the room from the GovStack team and also from um, the Horn of Africa initiative. Um, like our colleague Steve is here from uh, Kenya. And um, in my understanding, and I um, hope I got this right, because as you've just heard, I just took over this position like a month ago. But um, you asked for do actually different countries look into several, like let's say building blocks in order to um, enhance exchange and digitalized like in a in a faster way and i think from my perspective we're doing this with the horn of africa initiative and this is also where we get co um, commissioned and co-financed by the european commission in order to get the economic situation and the transfer us in the countries much better but um by doing this maybe uh, steve would you like to uh, if you have two three sentences for us in order to yeah let us know what's happening there and maybe you can answer this question better than i do thank you mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, my name is Steve. I'm with uh, uh, GIZ Kenya, and I, I sit on uh, the Horn of Africa initiative, which means Kenya, Somalia, and Djibouti. So uh, maybe just a few words there. Um, we are engaging these three countries. I'm going to rope in uh, the gentleman's question there about uh, cross-border uh, trade and, and similar activities. Um, so what's happening is we, <clears throat> we have country co-design sessions or co-design calls where we engage these countries individually 
and try to identify use cases that can be piloted in, in, the, in the sandbox environment. However, one of our objectives or mandates as, as an overarching um, objective is regional cohesion. So to identify use cases or services that can work or foster a regional cohesion. So cross-border trade is really one of those services. However, when we go into these countries, you do realize that they are at very different uh, levels of whether it's technological uh, readiness or even just infrastructure, connectivity, etc., etc., digital uh, capacities, and so on. So what we do is initially, this is a very early stage, um, initially we go into these countries and, and get them where they are. So, so the cross-border kind of regional cohesion activities, we put them at a, at a secondary level. So we try and tackle really what's most foundational and basic. And then once we have that uh, uh, foundation, we can, we can branch out. As so, as so, that. Super. Okay. Thank you very much. We have uh, four more hands I've seen. And then I would invite all uh, panelists again to make some closing remarks and to answer, hopefully, some of those questions. We start with the lady over yes, there. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Christine from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, of Norway. Um, it's very interesting to hear uh, about the, the GovStack initiative. Uh, our state secretary is going to join uh, the, the high-level event um, that Germany is hosting on, on the 1st of December, and she will say more about it. <laughs> um, Norway uh, took the initiative to follow up uh, the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on, on digital cooperation uh, and, and took the initiative together with UNICEF to establish the Alliance for Digital Public Goods a lot. Uh, and um, it's been uh, growing, and I'm very happy to have Estonia and, and Germany and several other partners uh, on board. Um, the Digital Public Goods Alliance is working more broadly than the GovStack, because the GovStack is, of course, uh, focused on uh, uh, public digital um, infrastructure, uh, but the Alliance is also working on uh, with uh, public infrastructure in this area, uh, not at least the, the digital ID uh, module or open source identity platform that a lot of countries now are signing up for, including Ethiopia. My question is only how do you see the Digital Public Goods Alliance work? Um, in relation to the GovStack initiative, when it comes to coordination, I mean, the the alliance of, of public goods, digital public goods, uh, is pretty much, uh, they are very operational uh, also. They are rolling out and financing and technical assistance uh, at the country level in various sectors. Uh, and we, from the Norwegian side, have provided a lot of digital public goods uh, into this uh, <laughs> alliance. Uh, for instance, the health information system that is now in, in use in, in in more than 70 countries around the globe um, because we have to find a really good uh, division of labor uh, of course between the initiative we have to coordinate um, uh, we are very persistent from the Norwegian side to avoid fragmentation competing initiatives I'm not saying that cost stack at all is that but in general and also building down the silos uh, yeah. we are happy to have um, uh, the US, the Americans, um, more close <laughs> to us now mm -hmm. uh, in the alliance, uh, which is an important uh, actor in this uh, area. So yeah. if you have some thoughts on, on how GovStack and, and the Alliance for Digital Public Goods can work. Let me try to yeah. manage time exactly. And Norman, please, I think you are next here. Well, I, I have a comp uh, Norman, I'm heading our portfolio on digital in Rwanda, SGZ. Um, very nice and interesting presentations. Um, uh, I have a comment and a question. So I'm adding to Joseph's uh, observation that GovStack is actually also about connectivity and, and access uh, in general. And if you look in Rwanda, and the example was given with the Rambo, what they actually managed was uh, basically setting up uh, a network of agents uh, who had access and then basically providing through this access to millions of, of citizens. And I think this is a very important observation also um, to what Nila was saying actually that a lot of uh, digital government is not about technology. Um, so my question actually goes a bit to assist this direction what GovStack as an initiative should actually provide when it's not particular about technology, but still we talk about the stack that is obviously a lot about technology, uh, but many of uh, what we probably need to provide and discuss is also how this actually can ex we give access for citizens, how it changes institutions, etc. So the question would be a little bit how to come to this kind of service offer. Understood. Thank you. The lady over there. 
Um, uh, my question is actually kind of a follow on from the question that, that you've raised. So I really appreciate you acknowledging um, you know, that this isn't necessarily a technical question. It's also about how the technology is used. And my name is Carolyn. I'm with Access Now, which is a global digital rights organization. Um, and I think you know we've seen that there are benefits from from the rollout of digitalization and, and digital identity systems and other related projects. But we've also seen that this often can amplify disparities and kind of intensify abuses that are already happening. So in thinking about the design of, of the, Gov, the GovStack tools, and we're talking about resilience, to what extent are we thinking about designing those tools in a way that are going to be resilient to things like overreaching surveillance, resilient for communities who are targeted with internet shutdowns? Um, if we're moving people into a more digital space, but they're already um, you know, facing discrimination in other ways, how is the system going to, to support them in, in overcoming those challenges? Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I have to close the round of questions here because otherwise we wouldn't have time to actually answer those uh, questions. Uh, and uh, I would want to invite all panelists to give a final statement, but I would start with Joseph, please. Thanks. Um, Caroline, let me jump directly in, because uh, what we have seen is that the, the decentralized structure of the internet routing can actually be transformed. And I, I want to pick up, uh, Andrea, what you talked about Ukraine, because we've seen now in the war, Ukraine is building 4,000, I call them info spots, where people can come where they have a warm, where they can charge their phones, and where they have internet access. And this model is probably a model which we could bring further out uh, or which we should think about of bringing it further out and uh, when we talk about GovStack the question is uh, to to what degree can we make GovStack distributed uh, you talked um, uh, sorry Norman you talked about the the agents and uh, the story of the agents is that we need to have a slim golf stack to actually achieve the services because in the remote areas we can't assume that we have a broadband connectivity and uh, like um, uh, towards uh, uh, Christine uh, what we discussed a lot is uh, the digital public goods and the golf stack as a repository is something different from having them in use by the community and that is i think the the challenge which we all have now in the upcoming years thank you joseph gautam um over to you again maybe you have also some uh, thoughts you want to share uh reflecting the questions please experience we've really seen that we cannot even uh, we cannot start with let's go digital and everyone will be able to access it we really believe in a process where uh, you have both intermediated access uh, as well as digital access and intermediated access is required for people who might not be comfortable with technology might want the comfort of actually interacting with another human being um, so by default in all our program design we do advocate very strongly for governments to ensure that there's multiple channels of access and then to ensure that each of these channels is treated on par whether it's online whether it's a whatsapp chatbot whether it is actually someone calling in on a phone call or someone walking up to a you uh, counter at a government office or possibly even in a self-help group. Um, in fact, in that uh, particular instance, I would actually say what we should also be thinking about is what are the operating models that GovStack can give countries that can then be re-leveraged. So in India, for example, Google created this idea of internet shatis, which I, who actually were women who cycled around villages training other women on how to use the internet and helping them start getting digitally literate. Um, similarly, we are seeing in some of the low-income neighborhoods and cities, uh, self-help groups actually play a very strong role in connecting communities to government and because of this uh, role of intermediation what they're also able to do is minimize some of the discrimination that would otherwise prevent people from accessing services um, to the question that got raised about how do we watch out for amplification of disparities and uh, uh, reinforcing discrimination I think this comes back down to 
your charters around access to services, uh, which should have some of these equal access, equity of access uh, written in. And similarly, we should also be looking at which services in what sequence are getting digitized. So it should alarm us if it's primarily law enforcement that's getting digitized on day one, as opposed to public services being delivered to citizens. And so having those conversations about sequencing your different services in a way that you're promoting citizen benefit uh, and minimizing government overreach is critical throughout all of these pieces and we should try to ask GovStack include that in the playbooks that are being created. On the slim GovStack, I strongly believe that this is actually not an option, this is a requirement. The ability to figure out how offline uh, information can be captured and then synced in online later, how people are able to leverage uh, simpler, thinner clients on their phones, and sometimes even how this can be done in an asynchronous manner so that paper and uh, phones can get synchronized online later. Uh, we believe that uh, the current set of systems that we are looking at need to be evolved to meet that requirement. I'll pause there yeah. and hand back to you. Thank you so much, Gautam. Uh, Andrea, over to you. I give you one minute only, unfortunately. Thank you, Axel. That's pretty short for <laughs> three questions. You will manage. Huh? Yeah. Okay. First of all, um, yeah, regarding the question regarding the um, uh, Digital Public Goods Alliance, uh, first I would uh, like to emphasize that uh, I feel very strongly that we are lobbying towards um, <clears throat> a common theory of change. And this is the most important thing. Um, and this is where we are very closely in the ecosystem connected with the DPGA. In order to coordinate even better and to make use of the system, we just sent, um, we also sent a colleague um, uh, from ours yeah. to, exactly, <laughs> to know it to uh, support uh, live with the GDPA and we're very happy that um, we come together much more closely um, apart other things. Okay, I have due to the reason that I've just this one minute. Um, also, uh, Norman, your question also regarding, let's phrase it like the how to um, extend the digital divide in order to come from the technical and product side into how do we actually reach out to where we have to uh, end up with our services. Um, I would be so happy to um, start the discussion and I think this uh, is like a great chance that we have you also with the digital centers in Rwanda in order to look and Joseph and others working on those topics in order to come Come together as a community and to develop this further actually how could this look like maybe not the question is is this gas deck or is this even extended arm on that but i would be very happy to discuss this further and um then uh, thirdly your question also on the how can we secure that but um i think um GovStack is an open such an open forum and such an uh, open initiative and open source in order to make the best out of it and to gather all the expertise we can get um on the products and the blogs and the products that we're actually developing and so we're very happy for any sort of participation here in order to um make it to the best is just what i can say to this question and Thank you so much, Andrea. So the very last minute is for you, Nick. Please. Thank you so much. I, I will start with uh, yours. I completely agree that uh, these products that the GovStack is developing and those that it refers to need to be compliant with certain democratic principles and also rules. For example, the solutions need to be compliant with GDPR. And this is our task as GovStack to make sure it is that way. Now, how it is going to be actually implemented by different governments or other groups, uh, our arms are, are rather short as GovStack, but uh, our arms as tech diplomats are not. Uh, so this is actually our work to make sure that this virtual space remains an environment we want to be. And I'm very glad also to cooperate with Access Now and the, and the government of UK in leading the technology cohort of Summit of Democracy, where we will address many of, many of these issues. Uh, as to your question, uh, solutions versus uh, the implementation, um, as, as we know, the solutions only play a, a tiny role, but they do play a role. But I think we are, as GovStack, and, and I think also these countries that we work with, what is the saying? That we are between the rock and the hard stone here a little bit, because uh, on the one hand, uh, we understand that it takes long time, it takes sustainability uh, to reach really the aims of digital transformation or really get there. But on the other hand, uh, we also need, uh, politicians need also quick wins. 
uh, and uh, and sometimes um, it helps if you have some solutions uh, handy and and you can at least cut the time there, there to develop but uh, it's definitely an um, uh, an issue and and uh, and uh, finally the the most difficult uh, <laughs> question to uh, respond um, uh, around these different initiatives that have emerged around the public infrastructure and the public goods. There are many more. There is a digital public goods charter. Uh, recently, UN Tech Envoy uh, announced that there is going to be an additional digital public uh, infrastructure initiative. In the EU, we have digital commons. Uh, and uh, and I definitely see that uh, there is a, a more need to to bring these different partners together and and uh, I am glad that Govstack and the Public Goods Alliance have worked very closely and and Live is uh, <laughs> uh, partly responsible for this uh, great uh, great uh, uh, cooperation but. I personally admire the Public Goods Alliance very much because of these very clear and open principles on how it functions and how it cooperates with others. And I believe here we have, as a Kovstak, also quite a bit to learn from you. So, so thank you for this. But why there are so many the Public Infrastructure Initiatives? <laughs> and I think this, I, I guess we can see a new term being coined for potentially something that has been around for all the, these 20 or 30 uh, years. So I think we need to acknowledge also that digital public infrastructure, digital public goods is not a new miracle or, or remedy, but um, it is actually the continuation of work that has already been done. Uh, and uh, with this, I am done within one minute. Absolutely, one minute. Yeah, thank you so much. I think the panelists now actually deserve a clap now for a fantastic job, really in um, managing time here. And uh, really, I think you have not only explained what this initiative is all about, I think you have also highlighted challenges, the potential. We have also understood, I think, the more the, the history of, of all those efforts. Really, thank you so much. And I think uh, this was a good start for me also personally for this uh, IGF now. I wish all of you uh, an inspiring time here at the IGF. I think for those who would like to have more information about the initiative, I think there is a booth some, somewhere here. I think just go there and you can discuss with the experts. Enjoy the day. Enjoy the weekend, Addis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, we can have a photo. Let's take a picture. More. Uh, the, 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 how about you get over there? Get over there. Yeah. Was there someone waiting to get into the room? So let's let's uh, let's take a quick picture. Lily, do you have a ghost t-shirt already? Uh, many. <laughs> many. All right. But unfortunately, I don't have any with me here. I brought but I them. Also, uh, oh, but, but since... Uh, but I also could not wear, unfortunately, one of them. <laughs> Take a proper picture over there. And, uh, ask someone to... Ja, klar. Es steht und Ja, No, I can we can also have a quick on the on this space. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, how about we do Canada first, then we can. Uh, I have a few things.